Welcome to our monthly webinar series at ermac.ca. Um, we are um, the Information Resource Management Association of Canada, and we run this webinar series on uh, everything to do with data. Our logo also includes the phrase, love the data. So uh, my name is Deborah Henderson, and I'm currently the program uh, manager and director for ERMAC. Um, today's session is all about financial trends um, in uh, financial services uh, with regards to standards and regulations. Um, we have two speakers today. We have um, our vice president, Mark Prasad, uh, who will co-present on the following topics with James Mitchell, Senior Director, Client Data Governance Strategy and AML at RBC Bank. Um, what are the themes we are seeing on the regulatory front in banking? Um, this is all about um, the CIDC, the AML, CYC, all of these, uh, these acronyms, Bill, C86, et cetera. And where does client data management fit? Uh, with increasing data volume, the variety, the need for quality, et cetera, how can banks gain <coughs> client trust to leverage and harvest client data towards improving their experience uh, in trusted relationship that also affords them the necessary control around data use. Um, these are uh, conflicting perhaps, yet um, two sides of the same coin. So Mark Prasad um, is, uh, has a lengthy track record in defining and delivering transformational data and analytics initiatives for data-driven organizations. He has played roles in both industry and consulting and has been a conference speaker and lecturer on trends, value, and leading practices, implementation of the CDO function, and et cetera. Very senior as a former major bank CDO, Mark played the role of accountable executive for data and analytics. And he's currently at Sal Salem, Toronto, focusing on client data and analytics strategy, transformation, and enablement. James Mitchell is responsible for business intelligence, data governance strategy, and, and personal and com in commercial and per <laughs> personal banking teams in their ability to achieve business goals and objectives through the access of fully defined, safe, and reusable data and reporting structures supported by robust definitions and quality measures. The governance, <laughs> this work includes the establishment of a business intelligence data governance council that acts as a final arbiter and approver of all key data and metric definitions. The data governance work produces a semantic repository of business definitions that will empower greater access to data and business transformation and self-serve reporting uh, for business users. Welcome our speakers today, and I'll let them get underway and uh, stand back and watch, <laughs> and watch you do your thing. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Deborah. Um, I'm excited about today's uh, discussion. And what Jamie and I are going to do is take a very practical view of how to implement data management disciplines in banking. And we're going to cover a few things today. So what, what are you in the audience? Um, and by the way, welcome. Both of you li either live here today or you who will be looking in the recorded event later on. Uh, what, what we're hoping that you'll get out of today's session is there are four areas. One is uh, understanding key trends and themes in Canadian banking, as Deborah said. The second is a practical view of data strategy. Uh, one of the things that, that I'm seeing certainly uh, consulting in just not just banking, but in the hotel industry, retail, et cetera, uh, organizations are relooking at their data strategy because they didn't begin with the actual business strategy <laughs> and then thinking about that from a data lens, right? Kind of restating those strategies in terms of data. And then what are the implications of that? So we're going to talk about some of those things today. Uh, the third thing we're going to talk about is, is important, the importance of the people, process, data, and technology implications, again, of a data-driven bank. And finally, uh, a practical way of using regulations, again, embracing regulations, right? <laughs> regulations are there to protect uh, Canadians, consumers, uh, borrowers, 
organizations, et cetera, that, that depend on our very uh, healthy financial system. So how do we embrace those regulations? And Jamie's going to talk about that, um, uh, you know, something that, uh, you know, he's worked on over the last few years. And in fact, he and I worked together on, on a part of this, and that's how we, we actually met and became friends a few years ago. And, and so what is a practical way of doing this? And we're going to use, do that through the most complex data domain in most organizations, including a bank. That's the customer data domain. As you know, a uh, customer is central to value creation, improved experiences, risk and compliance strategies, and uh, in most organizations. And so those are the four topics for today. Let's begin. So key themes in Canadian banking, uh, data and analytics plays a vital role in protecting consumers, uh, lending responsibilities, and effectively managing risks. So we're kind of, we're going to go through um, a few of these. Uh, there's like, there's like four kind of major themes that banks are engaged in right now. The first one is, is B20. Um, you, uh, when, you, when you hear about B20, it's a set of guidelines around residential mortgage underwriting practices and procedures. Banks are concentrating on the fact that we have record indebted consumers and housing prices are rising in an interest rate. It's, or how housing prices are, are increasing in a rising interest rate and inflationary environment. Um, the ability to, to pay for consumers, therefore, is being challenged. Um, given how expensive homes are in the GTA, and again, the number of, um, you know, the, the, amount of, the amount of debt that consumers have, uh, whether it's HELOCs or mortgages or other, other borrowing, um, delinquencies are expected to, to rise. Uh, so loan adjudication and refinancing is, is under scrutiny. Um, HELOCs, so home equity, home equity lines of credit and equity lending against property um, have to use, right? And they're, they're going to really focus on the fact that um, the three C's of the, of the consumer are, are uh, observed. Are they capable? Do they have a good credit score? And do they have the capacity to repay? Um, I'll go through these and then, then Jamie, I'll ask, we'll ask Jamie to kind of give his thoughts on the, on, you know, the general um, climate in, in banking from his perspective. Uh, AML, so anti-money laundering and anti-terrorist financing, so regulated by FinTrack, again, increasingly important. Um, and banks are looking at, again, how to detect patterns around money laundering and terrorism. Um, Third-party risk management. This is really important because as banks are driving applications, data, and analytical workloads to the cloud, and having multiple a multi-cloud strategy with, with, with multiple cloud service providers, cybersecurity and business resumption and resiliency is really important. So what if what happens if something catastrophic happens and you've got your business running in the cloud? How do you resume your business? in a seamless way that does not impact Canadians or our economy. And risk data platform. So many of you may know that BCBS 239 came out a number of years ago. Um, it's, it's still an important set of guidelines for data management for an enterprise data platform, actually not just risk. And so those principles, uh, according to the Basel committee have only been adopted by about a third of banks to date. So. Um, important opportunities there that banks are still working on. And finally, open banking. This is a, a really important trend in banking. It's about the disintermediation of, of banking and opening up APIs and, and services that include um, a highly, that are working towards a highly competitive open, open banking system with numerous uh, low cost business models. So not just our banks, but FinTechs and crowdfunded equity lending being part of that ecosystem. So lots going on in banking. Jamie, any what are your thoughts on you know the the, the client the, the climate relative to the regulations and the opportunities? So thanks, Mark. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I just want to make sure the the audience aware is these are my views and and, and not RBCs. Um, uh, but let me let me just dig into a few things. So I, I think there are um, in my current role in 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 the bank I'm. I'm I'm responsible for a number of our large client data platforms um, from the business perspective. So I, I'm not a, a 
a typical technologist. I, I'm, I'm more of an analytics background on the business side, and now I'm uh, managing a couple of our core client applications um, where, we, where we maintain our, our golden source client profile data uh, for Canadian banking, um, not, not the whole of RBC. Um, the, the other thing I'm busy working on is, is, is a lot of work around AML. Um, and a number of uh, enhancements and changes to our to our systems to ensure that we're continuing to be compliant with with those guidelines and policies that are regulated by FinTrack. So let me let me just maybe touch on the five points here because I think there's a few themes that that follow through all of these. Um, and and the first one is so if if I look at you know B20, I'll be honest. The, I've had a, a, some experience in the past with credit policy and credit, credit processes and a lot of experience with our, our, our credit data. Um, but I think the thing to really look at here is from a data governance perspective, what does this mean? And, and much like you know, the challenges with AML and, and radar, um, the, it's the correctness of the data and it's, it's the governance around the the, the, the data is, is it correct? Is it correct for this use case? In, in this one, you know, it would be uh, credit scores and, and risk, risk capitalization and, and how we're reporting, you know, how we're protecting our clients, but also how we're protecting the bank and, and whatnot. Um, very similar to what we've done in, in Radar a number of years ago, which was all around risk reporting, uh, you know, that kind of basal um, evolution in, in, in my perspective anyway, went from, you know, we had a financial crisis in the globe and we needed to change the rules to ensure that, you know, banks weren't too big to fail and had adequate capitalization. And they started saying like, show us your numbers. Uh, and then that evolved over time to, the point where a number of years ago with BCBS 239, in my layman's terms, it was a lot of it was about tell me where the data came from and how you how it's correct and protected. And you know, I'm just going to use a prop because a lot of from a technology perspective, it's the data came from this file and it moved across and it was transformed. But really, they were asking where did it get input and who did that input. And what's the business process around the input? And then you get into the lineage and the flows and the definitions and, and the different things that, you know, the roles and responsibilities is outlined in, in you know, the data management book of knowledge and other, other assets like that. Um, and then I'm seeing that again now that I'm doing this work in, in AML, that, see, that theme is continuing into, you know, from a, whether it be, reporting KYC data, knowing your client data to the regulator, or it's reporting unusual or specific, suspicious transaction data. Um, again, it's, okay, great, there's the numbers, you're reporting it on time, you're not over-reporting or under-reporting, but what is the quality of the data there, and is the bespokeness of the data there, and are you reporting the right data on the right systems at the right time, uh, and how do you control that? Um, so that would be one major theme. Uh, the other major theme I'm seeing, just to come back to the data in terms of data strategy, is really that theme that you presented at the beginning. Uh, you know, the data strategy is a business strategy, and and to look at it as a technology strategy in isolation of the business is to is to miss something fairly critical. Um, and again, I think that plays back into the data governance, who's governing the data, where do they sit in the organization. And for a lot of this data, you know, transactional data and product data are very important. Um, they've typically been aligned based on the structure of the organization. Uh, and, you know, the, the transactions and products roll up to product owners and PL, PL, PL owners and and whatnot, and that's reflective, and it seems to work rather well. But the concept of the client cuts across that structure, and I don't think historically many organizations have really 
manage their data to, and, and their data strategy around the concept of the client and or the employee, or in our case, the advisor that interacts with the client. Um, and I think when we move into things like, uh, you know, not just the, the technology business resiliency of moving to the cloud, but also the security and privacy implications of that. And then you layer on what's happening with, with another federal bill, C-86, which is the Consumer Protection Act and, and things like consent and consent to sell um, along with some other things uh, in AML. And then just, I think it was announced today, uh, the federal government is, is looking at what I'm gonna call loosely a, a open banking czar. That's not what they're referring him to, to him as, but somebody to really step up and lead the movement to open banking. And for those that aren't aware of what open banking is, it's at the surface, it's looking at a technology model of APIs to share data based on client consent across organizations and empowering the client. But at the end of the day, what it's really about is providing and building trust with your client so that their clients are moving towards sharing their information more widely and doing so based on their discretion, their consent and the secure model. So those are uh, kind of the key themes I think I see, like how do we know the data is right? How do we evol evolve our data models from, from you know, uh, basic warehouses that represent operational systems or data lakes and how do we understand what the definitions are and source all of that, but really at a high level, when when can we use that data and in what use cases and in what ways? And how do we how do we manage it? And then moving back to how do we align the data based on the concept of the client? How do we govern in that? And in a lot of organizations, I like to ask the question, who owns the definition of the client in your organization? Because that is the seems to be in many places not well understood or well defined and there seems to be a lot of people that have skin in that game and not a lot of people that have overall accountability to that so those are some of the things that i think we should press into a little deeper mark wonderful jamie thank you now we're going to double click everybody into some of this because we, we want to give you good content today um jamie if i was to summarize what you just said very eloquently there is that the heart of all of this is trust. Tr uh, consumers having trust um, and then being able to prove to the regulators that you actually have the mechanisms, uh, you understand where data is created, the lineage of that data, the attestations of the quality and veracity of the data that's being used to help run the bank. And as banking becomes more open, it's not just the bank and the customer, it's the bank and other parties and the customer. And the customer is driving the the privacy and security needs and many may, of you may think this is just banking but when you think about it it's about consumers and privacy and services right we're in an increasingly service driven world and this model these regulations there are going to be versions of this in different industries so banking gets to kind of live the pain first but uh, thanks for your summary wonderful summary there jamie what we're going to do next is, is now talk about, we've said this a few times, data strategy is business strategy. The data-driven enterprises think about data and analytics as enablers of their business strategy. Um, many people think of that intuitively. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. But we want to illustrate with you to you um, a practical way, um, you know, as you do, as you as you kind of relook at your data strategy, or, or maybe you've done it this way already. But many folks, again, are kind of re-looking at their data strategies. Here, here's how, um, from a consulting, uh, you know, go-to-market uh, perspective, how, how we're kind of looking at it, uh, me and my teams. So we're going to take a few strategies for, for banks here and kind of illustrate with you the, the strategy. We're going to restate that strategy into, into terms that highlight data and analytics as, as enablers of that. And then... I'll, I'll, I'll ask Jamie to talk about the implications, which is, he's touched on some of those just moments ago, but we're going to go a little bit deeper. So the first one, uh, again, 
many organizations share these similar strategies. Um, these are these are somewhat for banks, but I think they can be abstracted to other industries. So attract new and retain existing customers, and and then grow business with those customers, right? So that's a high level strategy. Uh, if you were to restate that with data and analytics, that it's DNA. <laughs> Um, so attract new, retain existing, and grow business with customers by undertaking cust by understanding customers, cross-selling products and services, and anticipating their desires at moments of truth. A moment of truth is the point of interaction with the client, anticipating their needs at that client at, at that moment. As you can probably surmise, to understand the customer, you actually have to understand who that customer is, where they are in their life stage, um, looking at their their past, you know, kind of transactions and events, having a sense of, of, again, what might they be, you know, might they be at a point where they're looking at buying a mortgage and whatnot, um, and then uh, to anticipate their desires. So I think uh, you could see the DNA, uh, sorry, the, the, the aspects of, of data and analytics uh, in this now as we restate it. Uh, Jamie, do you want to maybe share some of the implications of this? Yeah, sure. Um... So, you know, if I look at the business strategy and, and even through the lens of data and analytics, this isn't a new strategy. Like we've been talking about deepening relationships with our clients and, and, and uh, cross-sell and, and, and these things for a very long time. Um, I think what data and analytics is, is how the advancement of, of data and analytics is, is things like predictive modeling, AI, um, different types of insights that we can gain. I think there's a lot of truth to that. There's a lot of opportunity and a lot of growth in that area. I think though, what we need to do from a business point of view is think about the relationship with the client and when and how we should leverage those new or advanced learnings or insights. Um, and I think that really comes down to how do we align the technology with the governance. And then I think the next statement to that would be, and how do we align that to the business strategy? And really it starts with the business strategy and goes to the technical solution. And sometimes it doesn't necessarily always play out that way. Uh, sometimes we, we get a really cool solution and then we look for an application, which, which is an interesting concept and can add a lot of value. But I think you've got to go back to What's the business driver here? And what's the relationship with the client? Why do you want to do that? You want to be able to build trust with your client and your regulator in some cases or, or whoever that might be. And that really gets into, are you using the right data in the right way? Um, is the information applicable? And you know, I look at things like predictive modeling around matching a client record from one system of record to another system of record. And the concept of is that when is a match that is predictive or algorithmic um, ready uh, versus to do that um, and use that data or when is it uh, um, perhaps a little bit, you know, not ready for prime time, or, or we could use it at a higher level of insights and analytics. So I think those concepts of, of decision rights and placement, um, governance really need to be driven from the business out. Very good. And, and again, as, as you're saying, in some cases, uh, again, uh, the, you know, the IT organization have looked at when you're defining solution architectures, function and data placement and so on. But, but truly, as you've highlighted, it has to be a business decision. Um, improving customer experiences and engagement. So we would restate that by, by, by including improving customer experiences and engagement through convenient tools and processes that amplify our understanding of who they are, so who our customers are, their evolving needs while respecting privacy, right? So as we, as we drive engagement through additional technologies, mobile platforms, et cetera. Uh, you know, this is, this is where um, I think knowing preferences and privacy and respecting those as part of those deployments is, is really critical. Jamie? Yeah, I would, uh, I would agree. And I think 
really when I look at this, I, I'm, I'm starting, you know, my regulatory hat's coming on and where's the regulatory environment going? And whether you look at things like, again, the consumer protection regulations, so to C86 and, and the consent to sell product, or you look at what was uh, C11 in the last government, but it looks like it's going to be resurrected as, as a new bill yet to be determined around you know, privacy and layer in the, the upcoming changes and, and movement on open banking. All of those things center around the concept of consent. And how do we manage consent? How do we get the client's consent? How do we get the client to buy in to give us more consent? That's through trust. And the other thing I'm going to say on this one is historically in, in different industries, and I know this is true for banking, when we ask clients for consent, we've asked them for very broad sweeping consent around the usage of data. And it's generally for sharing data within the organization or different parts of the organization and or sharing data with marketing to solicit, you know, the new business and opportunities to the client. And, and it's usually an opt-in or opt-out model and it's, it's held at a very high level at the client around a couple of meaty topics around consent. Where the, where the regulators are going is a lot more granular. Um, so C86, it's actually the consent to sell the product, whereas, um, you know, before we would have said we have the client's consent, stop. Now it's, do we have Mark's consent to sell X product and how do we manage and capture and prove that? Um, if you do that the right way and, and you, you have the right data structures and you think about the client engagement strategies, you can actually leverage that into a driver to gain more trust with your client, to ask them, to give them more control over their information and build that trusted relationship. So I think that's really a, a point where we can, we can turn the, 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 the stick of the regulation into an actual opportunity or carrot, right? And I, and I think there's a lot of, a lot of potential there. Great way to think about it. So, and, uh, sorry to interrupt, Jeff, but we actually have a question. Uh, yes, sure, go ahead. Isn't it tough to get a focus on the customer and away from the product? Are banks still stuck in understanding that intersection? Yes, that's, in fact, in, in fact, so that's a really great question and it's a fundamental question. Hey, Jamie, if we finish up these, um, maybe I think it's the three more of these, I think that's yeah. a great way to summarize what we're showing here because it's that great question and it's fundamental to the strategies of these banks because away from product centric um, to, to customer centric. And then I think that's a great way to kind of summarize here. So thanks, thanks uh, Nick, for kind of bringing that up. Um, I'll go to the next one and we'll definitely answer that question. Uh, so leveraging geographic and technology scale to optimize operations. So this is really, to restate this, leverage geographic and technology scale to opt up, uh, optimize operations, including thoughtful standardization and integration of systems and, and data on premise and in the cloud. Um, so again, this is important because we get into uh, resiliency and you know business resumption and things like that as we as we expand out the the technology platform of a bank uh, outside of the four walls right of, of the bank on premise so on premise hybrid and cloud uh, Jamie your thoughts on this one so I agree I think there's there's kind of two tracks here right there's there's the technology resiliency what does the technology do and how are we safe and secure and, and safety and soundness and then there's the client aspect once again, and trust. So let me just take a couple of examples, just, just kind of, you know, just to make it a bit more real. Um, you know, when is it appropriate to use technology uh, such as flash memory, things like Redis or other, other solutions? Um, and when isn't it? And why I'm saying that is because let's think of the concept of master client data or master data that needs to be minted and secure versus high speed resilient caches to make things work faster and more seamlessly and, and which is which. That's an architecture and IT decision generally, but I think the business needs to be more and more involved in that because the placement of that data needs to be looked 
looked at through a business lens as to what needs to be mastered and what is the appropriate level of security and soundness of the master and are the business owners in fact aware of that and signing off and do they have the uh do they have the comfort level in in the solutions being proposed based on the use cases that they're being proposed to use um, and the reason i think that's important is because i think we all know from past experience that solutions tend to take on a life of their own and we develop something for a bespoke reason and then we extend its usage and sometimes we get a little beyond the the box of what it was intended to um, so again i think what's your governance strategy who's making the decisions and where is the business in that in that piece yes yes and and again really important principles uh, and operating principles Again, as we as we start moving workloads, data applications to to the cloud as well. So very good. Okay, the last one, and then we'll we'll kind of wrap up by answering our, that question. Um, so effectively managing risks and achieve uh, and achieve increasing compliance demands. Again, most banks have some strategy around that. So we could restate that by saying effectively manage risk and achieve compliance requirements by deeply understanding, predicting, and consistently managing risks. Again, data, it's all about data there too. Uh, Jamie, your thoughts on this final one? Yeah, I'm just gonna kind of keep this a bit shorter and, and more succinct, but ultimately the risk is owned by the business. And whether it's client data or any other data, that, that risk needs to be understood and owned by the, by the business. And the business needs to make the trade-offs around you know, when and how something is, is within our risk appetite. Um, so I think that again comes back to things like placement, design, and, and you know, really the overall arching concept of data strategy as a business strategy. We, we need to be aware as the risk owners what's happening and, and, and be part of that process. And I, you know, I can say at our organization, we, we do that. Um, and it has evolved over, I've been with the bank for a very long time and it's evolved over a long period of time. But I think we are moving more and more in that direction as the technology takes us there in order to digitize our, you know, our organization. Um, that's gonna be really, really important. And I think, you know, Mark, that really does lead us up to answer that, that question around moving from product to client well, really quite well so yeah why, why don't you go ahead and do that and um you know i would say uh that on, on this item as well um the three lines of defense model is is uh is something that the banks use so jamie what jamie is saying is that the the first line the business owns the risk here so um and so that's an important concept that i've been sharing with other industries actually um, because if you think about data as a strategic asset, that it has to be, you know, there's privacy that has to be ensured, uh, assured around that and uh, security. Many organizations have annual compliance that employees have to do. You have to do the course, you have to, you know, complete your certification that you're going to follow the, uh, you know, the, the guidelines and, and business conduct guidelines around security and privacy. Well, that's, you know that that's really three lines of defense in 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 implementation which we won't get into what what three three lod is you can kind of look that up if you don't know but i think it's a really important um kind of uh capability um and and uh you know a piece of piece of uh you know regulatory um uh you know imp implementation and banking that that i think is really important in making sure that everybody understands the their role in 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 uh, the risks they take in, in running an organization and that there's compliance and oversight that ensures that everybody does you know what they're supposed to especially again data and data is becoming we're moving it to platforms outside of applications applications used to en encapsulate data you'd have to have a login id and password and authentication when, when you move it out and you're bringing it together this is going to queue up jamie to answer the question beyond product systems um, and now you're into the realm of looking at things from a, I've got customer data, I've got product, I've got, you know, product and account data, I've got events and transactions, location, contract data, all in one place, right? So Jamie, to you now to answer that question about uh, customer centricity. 
Yeah, maybe maybe you take us to the next slide, Mark. I think that probably sets it up. Um, so it's a balancing act is really really where I think where we're going. Um, so let me maybe step back and address the question. So uh, if I remember it, the question was, is, is it difficult? Are you finding it difficult to move from a product view to a client view? Um, I would say, yes, it's getting much, much clearer over, the, I, I think just, I'm not speaking for RBC, I'm speaking more generally, but um, I think, yes, it's, it, it's been challenging in the past, but it's starting to get a lot crisper and clearer. I think, um, you know, as the concept of chief data officers and uh, has grown in the industry over quite a number of years now, I, I think that's gotten a lot, a lot better from a technology facing outway. I think where we're getting to now is where I, what I'm seeing happening is the business picking up more and more responsibility for that kind of piece. Um, I think it's, it is getting easier. I think one of the challenges that we have on the business side is, again, the business has been designed based on P&L structures and product structures. And, and now we're moving from that kind of vertical integration of the, of the business structure to a concept of data that cuts horizontally across that. Um, and, and that's really, really apparent when we're looking at client data, especially in client data management. I think though we can actually leverage, again, I, I can't hit on this enough. In, you know, in, in, in my experience, the uh, regulatory has always been looked at as thou shall do, and it's not necessarily what I want to do, and it, it, it takes me away from my business strategies and my business priorities. Um, we're in, I, myself and others, and Mark, you and I have been involved in some projects together over the time period that has tried to turn that dynamic around. And, and I think we're getting a lot more successful in doing that um, and leveraging the regulatory imperative as a business opportunity. Um, and it's an opportunity to do a number of things. One of them is modernize our technology and digitize our organization uh, in order to meet the regulatory need. But doing meeting that regulatory need, if you if you step back and you think about it in terms of where does the regulatory need fit into a business process, you can actually enhance and digitize that business process and create reusable capabilities and improve data quality. So now I'm talking about capabilities that can go into your onboarding flows, your product origination flows, your client management flows that are bigger than just the regulatory need. Um, the other thing I'm finding is you're doing it in a client-centric viewpoint that can scale across your lines of business. So if you're thinking about something like know your client, which in 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 uh, in wholesale markets and, and and capital markets and whatnot is a much more complex beast. But in retail banking, it's how do I know Mark is Mark? Um, that whole piece uh, can be rebuilt. It's it's very similar process whether they're buying a credit product or a deposit product or or a payment product or what have you we can do that then once and, and share that across and do it in a client centric way. And we can build those routines to refresh and ensure that data is accurate into business processes that are seamless for the client. Meaning that, you know, in the old days we would have had to send letters or have account relationship managers ask questions and follow up. And, and there'll still always be some people that we have to do that to because we don't interact with them as frequently as we want to. But for the vast majority of our people, our clients and our, and, our, and our partners, we interact with them on a regular basis and we can build those processes in. I think the other thing that you want to look at is where is the regulatory environment going and how will that then drive out these opportunities even more? And again, I think 
if you look at what we've done in C86, which is going out in the next few months, it's going into force with the government. Um, we are building in the consent process that we need into the flows that we interact with our clients in. It is much more seamless and it's gonna create a much more richer data environment. We're doing likewise, you know, as we scale up and get ready for things like the new privacy legislation and open banking, we're looking at how can we build those in, the, in a client-centric, scalable view that we can move in, deploy across our different businesses, products and processes, channels, what have you. Um, I think that, to go back to the question, yes, it's difficult. And yes, you're driving against, in many cases, a business structure that's gonna make decisions on funding with a product or, or, or uh, you know, segment or whatever point of view, and you're saying, you know, we need to lift that up and, and look at it a bit wider in scope. Um, it isn't easy, but I've found that as we've had successes, it's starting to snowball. And because our senior executives are starting, are really, they're not starting, they've been there longer than most people have been, but they're seeing how that uh, scalable, holistic client view approach is, is, is better from an investment point of view and a return point of view. And it is improving our relationships with our clients and our, and our associates, which is, you know, a, a rising tide that's going to lift a lot of boats, I think. So that's, that's how I would answer that question. Awesome. I love the fact that, again, you're a career banker and you're, you're just so up to date on all the regulations and where things are going and, you know, that uh, um, creating capabilities platforms that, that would continue to make, uh, take advantage of that. Um, uh, Nick, um, are there any other questions? I'm just looking at the time because we've got one more slide and we can go to that and maybe weave in some of these questions that might, might uh, you might want to share at this point. Sure. I'll tell you, we have two other questions. Um, one is, with so much regulation in financial services, how does a data governance or an analytics group rally those experts and have a path to better data use? It must be difficult. Uh, that's one question. And the other one is, in open banking, banking do you see data aggregators emerging on the equity trading side for customers? Or am I misunderstanding a possible implication correctly on a previous bullet point? Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll take the equity trading open banking question first. And, and I'm going to have to say um, I'm probably not the best person suited to answer a question about, uh, about trading and, and uh, some, of, some of those um, investment banking practices and, and wealth management capital markets pieces. I'm, I'm, uh, my focus in the organization is really much more about uh, retail and, and uh, commercial banking in, in Canada. It doesn't get into the trading stuff that much. Um, what I will say around open banking is what I am most interested in is as we look at new ways of sharing data between financial institutions, how do we base, how do we factor in um, the ability to uh, empower our clients to, to consent to, you know, sharing the, that information, whether it be for, you know, it could be for anything. Um, you know, historically there's been people in the industry that have relied on you know, third parties to aggregate information uh, based on the client's consent where, you know, the client has, I don't know, an online banking or an online presence. It could be banking, it could be anything in, in two different industries and they want to can see a consolidated view of their, of their assets. And it, it involves, you know, the old screen scraping kind of techniques and, and aggregation. Open banking is going to take us away from that in that it's going to, rather than you know, logging onto a consumer facing portal like online banking and aggregating based on, you know, screenshots of the data. It, it's actually going to be the institutions talking to each other through through different, you know, secure ways of transmitting the, the client's data. 
Um, to do that, I think uh, it really comes back to how do you empower the client to opt in or out of those of those different services, and at what level, and and at at what granularity, what channel, what product, what types of transactions, and how do you do that in a way that actually doesn't confuse the client. And again, the reason I say that in, in, in something like retail banking, we have a very diverse client portfolio. Um, some people are very digitally savvy, uh, really understand how to navigate these things, and then other people are less so. Um, so how do you create an experience uh, for the client that they understand what this is and how to adequately manage it? Um, and that they don't just blanket turn everything off or turn everything on in some cases. So that, those are my bigger concerns with, with open banking. It, it's more around how do we get the engagement with the client? How do we make this a positive experience for the client? How do we educate the client and do the change management with you know, Canadians uh, around this concept? The technology will follow. Um, and what I what I worry more is we drive these things from a technology point of view out, um, and and lose sight of the client experience and and you know our own business needs. But I hope that answers at least part of the question. Yeah, no, that that's great. And then the other aspect again, how does uh, a data and analytics, you know, maybe a COE, right? How what power do they have to to affect some of these? let's say data governance aspects around driving quality, timeliness, completeness of the data, et cetera, for the data services and products that they're building for, for the business. So maybe you can touch some of that on the next slide as we move forward. So sure. great. And folks, we're, we're now entering the, the last slide here. And thank you for your wonderful questions. Jamie, back to you. Yeah. So what, what we're showing here is really just kind of a, uh, you know, an illustrative model of, of, of what a, a client data management application or ecosystem could look like. Um, so really just quickly, and you know what, you might as well just bring all of the, the, the other side across, Mark. Um, I'll do this really quickly. So the, the diagram probably isn't too, you know, unfamiliar for different folks and, you know, different areas. But basically what, what we're showing is you know, if, if you think about the, the first, you know, three little guys going into the into this canister at the top, what we're trying to represent there is really, you know, these are these are consuming or interacting applications with with our main main front or uh, not mainframe, but our golden book of record for wherever it might be. In this case, it's client data, so that would be our KIF, and that could be the KIF for you know, a line of business or, or a channel, or it could, you know, could be just a subset of the client data for the larger firm. Um, and then if you take that down, the, the other two below it would just be, again, other KIFs within the organization that are maybe not integrated and haven't been integrated in the past. So you could have a client, uh, either a retail client or, or, or industrial client or whatever, replicated across multiple KIFs. From a data management point of view, what do you do about that? Um, so this gets into the whole, you know, my one of my least favorite terms in the world, 360 degree view of the client, because I don't like that term. I find it very misleading and superficial and simplistic. But what it really gets at is how do I know I've got the right mark, I've matched him, I have his consents and I have whatnot. So, you know, you bring that data into the center bot or through, through you know, our trans transformation and standardization processes, bring it into a hub and, and, and cleanse it, organize it. And, and then you can, if appropriate, mat do matching across different entities. There's lots of solutions for matching out there. Um, but really, I think the concept of a governance console or some kind of governance function in the business to review that set the right thresholds and parameters and, and, and turn that kind of high quality probabilistic matching into a, a determined, reviewed, certified, golden source record. You can do a lot more than that. 
with that reviewed record than you can do with just the highly probable. And then again, how do you then plug that back into other consumers and the consumers on the far side, in many cases are the same generators of the data on the other side of the model. It could be your CRM platforms, it could be your credit platforms, it could be your account opening or, or digital capabilities. And then the last piece down on the bottom is how do you then take some of that data, turn it into anal analytics or what I call a derived data asset. And then how and when can you put that derived data back into the flow in an operational sense versus just using it for management reporting and insights. At the end of the day, I think you got one more box to reveal there, there, Mark. Uh, it's it really comes down to unless you yeah, the you know, the data placement and the movement is driven by business use cases and business decisions. And I I can't I can't over over uh, overplay that one enough because again it goes back to the risk, what data can you use in what industry in what use case and and all of that other kind of stuff that we've talked about already. Um, to do this, I think, you know, we need to look at how are we designing and manufacturing and, and just, you know, what, what's that design look like? How do we go from a, a vertical business model to a horizontal client view? Um, and, and really kind of get into those, those different pieces. But um, Mark, you, anything else you want to touch on in this one or you want me to consider? Yeah, and I would say many people have probably seen this, this pattern before. Um, it's an abstracted conceptual pattern. It is independent of deployment. So this could be on-premise, this could be in the cloud, et cetera. But what's really important are the, are the people process um, governance aspects to this. My first implementation of a KIF, by the way, that's a customer information file and that's grown into master data management and other uh, related solutions to build that unified view, getting away from the product centric, but a, a human centered, customer centered view, customers and prospects, et cetera, uh, and, and really help drive all the things we've just talked, we've talked about, regulatory, um, improving customer experience, and, and you know, being able to um, engage in value creation. So, so new product services for clients, et cetera. This is fundamental. And so, um, I think what, what Jamie's saying is really important. We've all seen these pictures over the, over the years, but I, I would say that you know I've been fortunate enough to to work on you know with Jamie uh, a, a very sophisticated foundation of this that continues to be built out. And um, the piece you see around analytics again that's that's uh, that's one of the new things, right? Where if you have a unified view of your of your customer and their their preferences, their consents, and then you can marry that with other data, internal, external, that helps predict, again, at the moment of truth, what their intent is, why they're interacting with you, um, then that's, that's what's different here. So this hub, I think, is so fundamental to that customer-centered um, strategy and uh, experience uh, in, uh, as, as we move forward in, in banking, but, but other industries. So that would be, you know, uh, some additional points I would I would make, Jamie. Maybe again for the benefit of the audience, what would you say makes this hard? So, a couple of things. So, so what makes it hard? Well, typically, master data management is a is a is a term that most people, especially business people and even some technologists, reel away from. And it's because of a lot of the time it's because these things um, take on a life of their own and, and the project delivery scope is, is never really well defined or, uh, you know, boxed and, and, and whatnot. Um, again, I think looking at the regulatory environment as a driver for, for this type of investment is, is a real opportunity. Um, and the reason I say that is because you can define and box your scope. But you can do that with an architecture that's scalable so that once you start to deliver a value, you have the rudimentary pieces to expand on that. Um, for instance, you know, um, well, and the other thing I'll say in that is, is an example of that, which goes to, speaks to the analytics 
topics that Mark just brought up is consent. Um, and it's consent around usage of the data. So it's one thing to be able to leverage anonymized data to look at trends in the industry or in your company or, or whatnot. It's another thing to then take that and apply it to the client in, in, at the client level. In order to do that, you typically need to have the consent from the client to aggregate and use their data in a non-anonymized fashion, um, in a non-anonymized or use case. So once you move into that piece, you need to have the consent there. Again, you're getting back to this level of how do I build trust to allow the client to give me that consent? How do I make them easy for them to manage and interact with it? Having that kind of centrist, center client hub where you've got, you know, it's not all the data around your client. It's a, it's a, it's a minimal set of, of, of really highly governed and, and trusted data around the client to which you can augment with new consent models for the data where you capture that data and you have it available. And then you can ingest that into your analytics process so that you know when and where you can use the outputs of that analytics, the information at the client level for presentment of offers, for marketing opportunities or whatever. That keeps you on side of the legislation, um, but it also allows you to build more and more trust and, and, and relationship with that client, which deepens their ability and, and lessens their likelihood to attract. Um, so I think, again, there's that kind of, there's that opportunity there. And I think if we go back and say, how is it hard? It's hard to get it started because everybody goes to the colossal scale. You know, I think you have to, you have to expose that that could happen and that there's risk with that, but I think you have to make it um, a targeted, understood, well-defined scope of a delivery program with real business benefits attached to that, that you can come back in six, 12, 24, 36 months and demonstrate. Um, and then as you do that, it will, in my experience, take on a, a, a much more accelerated evolutionary path where you'll get more investment, you can do more things, and if you've done your homework up front on the model that is scalable for your business needs, you, you can mitigate some of that development risk of getting stuck in a box that you can't get out. So that, that's what I would say, Mark, is. What, is, what wonderful. And, and in fact, um, if you think about the future of banking, open banking, this is an event-based architecture. So like that just positions banks for, for that future. And as Jamie is saying, start with an MVP, start small, you know, make it happen, grow from there. Jamie and I spent with our teams um, a number of late evenings solving some of the complex integration, multimodal integration um, patterns. And, um, but, you know, once you get that right, it's built. And um, so the other thing I would say, again, what's new is that data steward console. Uh, I think this is back to the question around, again, even the problem of data quality, data governance, um, as an analytics team, how can you, more automation be used? Well, um, uh, machine, supervised machine learning is, is now being used, like if you use predictive models like Monte Carlo simulation and other techniques, the, the human, the steward would then get, receive, right, from, from this environment, from, from the machine that says, hey, you know, I think, this is the right match. I've done probabilistic matching. Can you just validate that? And then that just reinforces and continues to get more sophisticated. So everybody, thank you for your time today. Hopefully this was uh, beneficial. Um, Nick, back to you to, to help us wrap up. And do we have any final, final uh, questions? Uh, do we have time for them? I think we have time for one final question in chat. They say, sorry if this is going out in a crazy direction, but thinking in web three terms, are DAOs, AKA Decentralized Autonomous Organizations also on our radar? That's a great question. I love this audience. Uh, Jamie, do you have any thoughts on DAOs vis-a-vis -vis Web 3.0? <laughs> I'm going to have to take the fifth on that one, Mark. I, I, uh, I need to do a little bit more research on it to, to give it to answer it justice, you? Yeah, I, I honestly haven't done a lot of thinking about it. I think it's a great question. Um, 
if we take the the audience member that that actually asked the question, happy to kind of have a chat with them afterwards. But I think uh, I love the questions. I mean, obviously, this audience is focused on the future of of data analytics and data management. Thanks, everybody. Um, and um, Deborah, do I maybe we could pass it to you to wrap up if you're still with us? Yeah, yeah. Um, th this has been uh, really an interesting discussion. And what jumped out at me was a phrase I think that James uh, said. Uh, that we're controlling, uh, we're driving the data asset. And, you know, that's, that's really what business and data strategy do together. Um, and you drive it in, um, you know, um, um, a, a planned way um, where, you know, you are within the, the curbs, as it were, of, of regula regulation. And, and yet, um, you know, you have a path forward where, um, again, he said showing value in, you know, six months, 12 months and so forth. So in, uh, although a lot of this is, I think this might be interesting to look at, kind of ad hoc, that you do have, um, you know, uh, the plan, the, the, um, the POCs, the, um, the publicity, uh, the PR around um, uh, your data asset and what you're doing with it. So, you know, it, it comes in, um, you know, a planned package um, uh, that goes all the way from business to uh, back to business as, uh, in terms of business value. So thank you so much for your time, Mark and James. And uh, join us next month. Uh, we're always the third Wednesday of the month, unless you get um, told otherwise. <laughs> and tune in to our uh, next session, which it looks like will be on data maturity management and assessment.